a while ago, this book actually changed my life. It really did, certainly my thinking about our animals and about the ways we do and do not care about them. So I am really delighted, and you read, uh, I'm hoping that you did, read a bio of Wayne Vassell and all who brings to us. Because this book is full of wonderful stories, of the beautiful bond that, and the connection that we humans have with our brothers and sisters of all creatures on Earth, bears and others. There's a couple of wonderful little stories in here, that, and many of them. It's a delightful book to read, and I'm not here to promote Wayne's book, but well, maybe I am. <laughs> I want to invite him. It's wonderful to see somebody doing life work about which they are so passionate and work that needs to be done so desperately. So please, let's welcome away to sell it to our uh, Being here and in your church and feeling the spirit and hearing this glorious music from you, Rochelle, and you, Christian, uh, this is just Fabulous, so I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. And thanks everyone for coming out this morning and for, for uh, hearing uh, Jan's message, but of course uh, a little bit from me about this work that we do at the Humane Society of the United States for animals. Uh, this is the 60th year of our organization, and one of your members, Anita Poop, was one of the seven chairs of the board of the Humane Society of the United States. And uh, she had such an instrumental role in shaping the organization and directing it selflessly, uh, serving as a volunteer for the organization. And really what amounts, as Brad would say, probably to a full-time capacity for 20 years or so. So it's been a, a really, really uh, wonderful and special thing for me that the Humane Society and my interest in animals connected me with Anita and of course with Brad, and it's been a life-changing thing for me to have this opportunity to get to know Anita. So I'm just the sixth CEO of the organization in, in, in our 60 years, and the two prior CEOs actually were clergymen uh, before they uh, came to the organization. And we've always had a very rich and deep faith tradition at the organization, and we actually have a faith outreach program. We have a national faith outreach council that includes uh, clerical leaders from all the world's major religions. And one of the things that we say at the Humane Society of the U.S. is that uh, we are not trying to invent a faith-based concern for animals. We're simply reminding people of faith about the great traditions that exist within their own uh, universes and experiences and traditions uh, about decency and mercy and kindness to animals. You know, in Genesis, uh, God declared the animals good, and he made a covenant not just with people, but also with the animals. And the work that the Humane Society does, like a lot of other organizations in our society, is designed to do good in the world. I think of our society as really a remarkable one. Alexis de Tocqueville, more than a century and a half ago, talked about the incredible uh, character of Americans. And he saw it in the philanthropic and charitable work that goes on in our society in his travels across the country. And now, it's quite remarkable. We have 1.5 million charitable organizations in the United States. Think of this. 317 million people sustaining one and a half million charities. Many of them are, are great institutions like the Union Church here and many other uh, churches and houses of worship. There are educational uh, charities, whether they're for uh, young kids or for higher education. There are uh, groups, and of course the people that are animating those groups working to alleviate poverty, uh, suffering from disease, protecting the environment, uh, caring for children uh, who are orphaned or homeless, caring for all homeless people. I mean, this is the incredible part of our American society, is that
that we have this pluralism of, of concerns. It's actually quite good, I think, that we all don't have the same single consideration. I mean, if we were all just concerned about nuclear proliferation and nothing else, even though that's a very you know, serious concern in our world, where would that leave the homeless people? And where would that leave the environment? And where would that leave so many others in need? And I care about so many things. Uh, but animals from my youngest days moved me. And I think like a lot of kids, as I wrote in the Bond Jam, I had this connection with animals. And I think so many kids do. Think about your own childhood and your own connection to creatures. Jan read that book to us, which was a beautiful, uh, beautiful thing to do. But 90% of the images in children's books are of animals. Kids learn about the world through animals. They are different. They are distinct from us, but the differences aren't disqualified. The differences are remarkable. These are beautiful creatures with big, beautiful eyes and beautiful fur. They can run fast, they're athletic. Animals excite us. Animals are magical to us. And kids, not bound by some of the cultural uh, boundaries that we, that we create, see animals in this glorious sort of, uh, of uh, existence that they have. So I have this appreciation for animals and this love of animals. And as I said yesterday at Anita and Brad's home, when I learned about what was going on with animals, I decided I wanted to do something about it. Just like there are people who are fighting for the homeless, or just like people who are working to protect the environment, or to cure cancer, we're a better and stronger society because people are working on all of these different issues. But I really believe that animals matter. You know, whether you take a strictly faith-based concern, and look at the issues of stewardship and custodianship and creation care. And again, I think whether, whether it's a Christian tradition you follow, or an Islamic tradition, or a Jewish tradition, it all leads to the same place about kindness and decency and mercy. It's, it's just part of the fabric of these religious traditions. Or if you take a strictly science-based view, you know, we've learned so much about animals. When I was a kid, I read about Jane Goodall uh, doing her work with chimpanzees in Tanzania and observing the chimps and the chimp culture. Now we know that chimpanzees share more than 98% of our genetic material. You know, it used to be a few decades ago, not too long ago though, that a lot of scientists said, well, animals are just operating by instinct. They're programmed almost because of their instincts in some endless quest for food gathering opportunities and mating, as if they don't have feelings and emotions, that they're just almost like a computer operating out there, programmed by evolution to do all of these things. Well, I think we know from our common sense experiences that animals are a lot more than just automatons operating by instinct. They have feelings and they have emotions. I mean, I'm sure just about every one of you now or in some prior time in your life had a dog or a cat or some animal in your home. They're not just a collection of neurons. They are creatures that are cognizant of the world. They're conscious. And of course, you know, in one capacity they are our equals. And that capacity is their ability to suffer and to feel. I mean, you step on a dog's tail, or see an animal struck in the road by a car. I mean, your heart breaks for these creatures. That's the great part of us, our humanity, our compassion, our other-centeredness. It makes us human. And for me, as I began to learn about what was going on with animals, this love and appreciation that's manifest in so many ways in our society from pet keeping and wildlife watching and in terms of so many people who worked on these issues, the existence of anti-cruelty laws that forbid malicious mistreatment of animals. 
our setting aside of national parks and state parks and backs of state park here in Maine and so many other wild areas, kind of as a tonic to the soul. And even in our biggest cities, in New York City, what do we have right in the middle of the city? The city planners put a park right in the middle of it. So in this height of human civilization and construction and development, we want a place to go to connect with nature, to see animals. This is part of who we always have been as a species. And if you look at surviving tribal societies that are in the Amazon or in Papua New Guinea, or even the high Arctic, the people who depend on animals have an ethic of respect and appreciation for them. Even if they take the lives of those animals, they have rituals of apology and atonement to the animals. And now we, in our civilization, even when we're in a setting that's fabricated by you know, all of the innovation and ingenuity that we're capable of, we still want these touches with nature. Having pets in our homes, experiencing wildlife, going out to the park. Every year, 300 million person visits to America's national parks, just one category of federal lands. We are drawn to nature. When I woke up this morning and saw the rocks and the beautiful ocean from uh, Brad and Anita's home, how can you approve on this? Nature is remarkable. And as Jan was talking, I was thinking of this picture over here. I was thinking of this, this uh, earth in our hands. And you know, we just had the 45th anniversary, I believe, of one of the Apollo missions, where we created this incredible rocket through human design and ingenuity. A powerful rocket ever. And we got out of the gravitational pull of the earth and got close to the moon. And, uh, one of the astronauts took a picture of our blue green earth. And it was so tiny in this vast universe. And it was just this tiny little spot of blue. I mean, what a fragile life zone we have on this planet that sustains us. The air that we breathe sustains the other mammals and the birds that inhabit this planet. The water that we drink sustains them as well. We depend on this environment being clean for us to live. It has to be nourishing to give us food to survive tomorrow and the next day and the week ahead. So we are connected to nature and we have all of these expressions of kindness and appreciation for animals that exist in our society. We have taboos against cruelty and you'll find very few people who say it's okay to be cruel to animals. The problem for us comes in application. Because animals are embedded in many different sectors of our economy. And so much of it has become routine and normalized that we don't even think about it. It's just the natural order of the day. Just as a lot of things that we used to do became the order of the day because they persisted for so long. And I think what Anita and I and Dane and others are trying to do at the Humane Society, and obviously what Jan is doing so beautifully, is asking us to think about our responsibilities to that little fragile planet and to all of the inhabitants on it. Are these just a collection of resources? Are the animals just tools for research? Are they game to be harvested? Are they units of production on a factory farm? Are they just things for us to use? Well, whatever way we wish. God said the animals were good. He created a covenant with them and with us. We are supposed to exhibit responsibility for these other creatures. We don't talk so much about animal rights at the Humane Society. We talk about human responsibility. It's really more about us than it is about them. Of course we have to have a basic understanding that animals think and they feel and they have their families and they have their lives and they have their communities. But it doesn't take much to get to that point. <coughs> but we have this immense power over other creatures. We can destroy their species. 
We can subject animals to privation and misery on a factory farm. We can do lots of terrible things to other creatures. We can stage fights between them, between dogs, and watch them battle, or between roosters and watch them fight. We can kill animals for their fur and adorn ourselves. We can do lots of things to other creatures. But our argument, of course, is not that we humans should do whatever we wish and whatever we want, because we can do it. We should show restraint in the face of opportunity. It's really more about responsibility than license. And there are so many issues that we work on, whether it's factory farming and now our systemic mistreatment of animals raised in food, where animals are confined in cages and crates barely larger than their bodies, pump them full of hormones or antibiotics or substances like rectopamine, which are ultimately unsafe for us and unsafe for our society. You know, 60% of the diseases that afflict us started in animals. Ebola is one. They jump the species barrier. Whether it's the use of animals in entertainment, like fighting, whether it's puppy mills, when we've got animal shelters, which are desperately working to adopt out homeless animals, we've got 10,000 puppy mills churning out animals to the pet trade, <clears throat> whether it's killing of whales or dolphins or seals, because that's the way it's been done for a long time. I mean, think of these, these whales, you know. Brad said he hadn't seen a whale on the shore here, but yeah, these are the biggest animals that have ever lived on the planet. The blue whale can live to be, can live for, you know, more than 100 years and can be 100 feet long. And weigh nearly a hundred tons. And we send an exploding harpoon into their body, you know, extract a little bit of meat or some oil, neither of which is necessary for our survival. I mean, the United States used to be the biggest whaling nation in the world. Whaling ships used to leave from Bedford and Nantucket and other coastal communities and fly the world's oceans to kill these creatures or at the time, the burgeoning 19th century economy. But we found alternatives. We discovered other ways to fuel our economy other than whale oil. And now we flipped it. And now the ships that are leaving from Nantucket and New Bedford are whale watching boats, where we watch these incredible creatures in glory in their design and have our breath taken away about how magnificent they are, and then we leave them there to live another day. And from an economic perspective, the beauty of this is you can watch a whale a thousand times. You can harpoon the whale only once. We've got much greater economic opportunities if we choose to be decent and good to animals. Our fate has always been bound together with them. And it ties into so many other social concerns in our society. You know, people do say, well, why this issue or that cause? When I work on animals, it binds me to other causes. When we see animal cruelty in the household, we see in 75% of those cases there's some other form of abuse. One day it's animal cruelty or abuse, another day it's child abuse, another day it's spousal abuse. Because the underlying motivation is this misuse of power. People are misusing their power, and it can be different victims on different days. When we mistreat these animals on the factory farm, that's not good for the animals, but it's not good for the environment, it's not good for us. All of these things are connected. And this notion of kindness and mercy, if we're good to animals, we're building values that make us a better civil society. Because when we train ourselves to be kind and other-centered, it's going to radiate out in other ways in our society. And when we show cruelty and disregard, can we possibly think that it's not going to manifest itself in other dimensions or in our behavior or social behavior in society? So we work on a wide range of issues, and I'll just say a quick word about the issue that's looming here in Maine. 
we could address many different subjects, but one subject that's been an historical concern of ours is this abusive treatment of the state's bears, one of the great wildlife species in the state and iconic species in the state of uh, Maine. And Maine is the only state in the nation now that allows uh, trophy hunters to go out um, and chase bears with dogs, to bait them with foods, and to put traps out to catch them. So there are some states that do baiting a small number and some slightly larger number that do hounding, and no other state that does tracking, but no state, again, does all three of these practices. And three or four thousand bears are killed in the fall, the killing will start uh, very soon in the state. But for the last couple of weeks, the baiters have been putting out food, they've been putting out jelly donuts and rotting meat parts and grease and other sorts of food that has been left behind. And they put it in barrels and the estimated total is 7 million pounds of bait are dumped into the main woods. And it's done mainly to facilitate a relatively easy kill of the animals. And most of it's done for commercial purposes to have out-of-state hunters come in and spend just a couple of hours and shoot a bear while he or she is feeding on the bait side. And the dogs, you know, they have these dogs that are fitted with transmitters on their collars and the hunter has a directional antenna. And it's kind of a war games situation. The bear uh, being the victim only. And the dogs eventually get a scent of the bear and they chase the bear sometimes for a mile or five miles or ten miles, exhausting the animal. And then the bear flees going up into a tree and then the hunter uses the directional equipment and goes to the base of the tree and shoots the animal out of the tree. They have strong animals, they might weigh 250 pounds or 300 pounds and they're really muscular. So this, they're just walking in the woods, just living their lives, and suddenly an animal who's known nothing but freedom, nothing but freedom, is snared with this wire cable. And as the bear uses his or her muscles to pull away, to try to break free, the snare tightens, gripping the animal's body tighter and tighter, cutting off the circulation. And it's embedded in the ground or onto a tree so that the bear you know, can't pull it out of the ground. And the animal may languish for six or eight or ten or fifteen or twenty or twenty-four hours. Imagine if you were caught with something wrapped so tightly around your body, if you knew only freedom, you were struggling hour after hour to get it out. I mean, imagine the terror and the pain that this animal's enduring. And then, eventually, somebody shows up, it's supposed to be every 24 hours, but it could be 36 or 48 hours, and shoots the animal for their head, for their trophy. You know, there's a big main tradition of hunting deer and consuming meat, and I'll tell you that for those deer, that's probably a much better outcome than the animals, the pigs, and the turkeys, and the chickens on the factory farms. Those animals are living in confinement for months on end. And they can barely see the sun and never get out. They never feel so many their feet, they're overcrowded, the smell of ammonia and other waste is just enveloping their, their little mini atmosphere that they live in. But there's no baiting of deer, there's no hound hunting of deer, there's no baiting of moose, there's no hound hunting of moose, there's no trapping of these animals, there's no baiting of ducks and geese. We're doing this to these bears because it used to be that we wanted to wipe out all the predators. We just about wiped out all the grizzly bears that just holding on in a small couple of ecosystems in the west. We just about wiped out the wolves, now they're finally coming back and their people want to kill them off. Now, just as they're regaining just a small little portion of the place that they used to call home. And this practice toward bears is a relic. But I was saying, that, as I was saying to Jan yesterday, you know, no form of cruelty occurs without a sophisticated set of defenses and rationalizations. I mean, I've debated these cockfighters and the dogfighters and the seal clubbers and the whalers. They all have all sorts of defenses. 
So you'll hear all sorts of stuff about science-based wildlife management, controlling the bear population. The reality is no other state does this to bears. Baiting induces bear problems. If you go to a state park or national forest that's signed and say never feed the bears, it somehow will make an exception for this category of forest users, the people who trophy hunt them. And when you supplementally feed these populations, providing them more sustenance than they get from what nature provides, it makes them more fit, it means they can produce more, and the cubs survive. So the whole notion that somehow baiting is needed as a population control technique is the opposite of the reality. The baiting creates bad behavior by habituating bears to human food sources, and it stimulates reproduction. So you'll hear all sorts of rationalizations, but we really hope you'll be not just voting if you're a main voter, yes, on question one, but we hope that you'll also spread the word to friends and family members. You know, it was just a few years ago that we finally outlawed cock fighting in the last state where it was legal in Louisiana. It was a tough fight, just like this is a tough fight. We just banned bear baying in the last state in South Carolina. So the march of progress on these issues can sometimes be slow. We're always meeting with some resistance. But the sweep of history is moving in our direction. People are more conscious of animals. They're more conscious of our planet. They know that it's our responsibility to be good to other creatures. And I'm reminded, Jan, of the great evangelical uh, leader, William Wilberforce, uh, who in the later part of the 18th century and then really in the 19th century, an evangelical Christian who led the fight against slavery and who led the fight against child labor and who led the fight to form the first humane organization in the world. So in this one Christian leader, he was fighting against slavery and child labor and animal cruelty. And he was one of the founders of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in the 1820s. And that's the legacy that we're building upon in advancing these ideals. And Maine has always been part of that. In 1821, Maine was the first state in the nation to adopt an anti-cruelty statute. It was the first state to kind of really try to memorialize this covenant that God talked about with the animals. So it's been nearly 200 years. And it's about time for us to stop these inhumane practices that are terrorizing these poor creatures who just want to live their lives in the forest. So I'm really grateful to all of you for giving me a little bit of time to talk about what is an important issue to me, but I think it's an important issue for the whole of society. Animals are a great part of our lives. They're a critical part of our planet. It would be a very boring world without the animals. What would those children's books be built for? And I think it's, uh, it's up to us to, uh, to show our mercy and decency. So thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. These are our sisters and brothers, and we need to do all we can to take care of them.